Sometimes we just have to slow things down. Sometimes we just have to allow the Lord to come in, rearrange our schedules, rearrange the way that we would want things to be done. And we just need to come to the altar. There's always time to come to the altar. There's always time to come to the altar. The altar is wherever you're at. It's wherever you're at. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that we just, we hear you. We feel you. We see you, Lord. You wanted us to just slow down and just seek you. Just come to the altar. And Father, we just ask, Lord, that you have your way in this place. Continue to have your way. Father, speak to us through the worship. Speak to us through the words. Speak to us as we encourage one another, Father. Help us to be able to go forward in you, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that you are a forgiving God. You are a loving God. You are a merciful God. You are a God of grace. You are a God of order. Lord, that no matter what we may be going through in our own lives, Father, you are still there and we can still find you. We can still seek you. You are still high on the throne and you still want to bless us. So we lay these things at your feet today, Lord Jesus. We lay them at your feet. We lay them at the altar. And we ask, Father, that you take them on. We did a burden exchange. We said, you say, take on my yoke because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Father, we just want an exchange for this heaviness, this oppressiveness, these situations and things that we are going through, that we laid them down today. And we thank you, Father, for loving us enough to take them on loving us enough to not turn away from us, loving us enough that we know that once we give it to you, it is taken care of in Jesus' name. So we thank you for all of that. We give you glory, honor, and praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, worship team. Amen. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to Redemptive Grace Ministries, a church that loves people, and we trust God. Good morning. Good morning. You may be seated. Pastor Jeff is like, good morning. He's ready. Amen. Amen. We are continuing this week on our series on home improvement, and uh, we are in our fifth week right now. We're going to go a couple of more weeks in it until the Lord completes what he has to say on building our house, our life, our home, our family. And uh, these are very simple things that we've been talking about over the last several weeks, but they're powerful if you implement them. A tool is no good unless you use it. And a tool is no good unless you use it and you use it properly. So you have to properly use the tools in order to get the set result that you would want out. Um, I used to play basketball for this coach in high school, and he said, um, practice doesn't make perfect. He said, perfect practice makes perfect. It makes sense. If you practice something over and over and over again and you're practicing it incorrectly, chances are in the game, what you practice, you will do. And if you practice it incorrectly, you're going to do it in the game incorrectly. If you have a tool and you use it incorrectly and you keep doing it incorrectly and incorrectly and incorrectly, chances are when you need to pull that tool out to really use it, you're not going to use it in the proper manner. So we've been, we've been discovering these tools in our home improvement series to build a better life, home, and family. And um, we're just going to jump right in because there's a lot to cover today. And um, Proverbs 24, 3, and 4 in the Amplified Version, this has been our foundational scripture. This has been our set scripture. And it says, through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a life, a home, a family built. And by understanding, it is established on a sound and good foundation. Next scripture. And by knowledge shall its chambers of every area be filled with all precious, precious and pleasant riches. We said last week, is this building is to, is to be built and rebuilt. So chances are maybe your, your house, your home, your life, maybe it's not built and you're building it now. Or maybe there's some things that have happened in it and you're having to go back and rebuild those things. It covers all of us. 
It covers all of us. And established means firm, foundation, stable, set. And if we build something wonderful and it looks great on the outside and the foundation is cracky or sketchy or not properly built, no matter how it looks on the outside, eventually it's going to fall if maintenance is not done to it. So what is, what is important is that we have that foundation right from the beginning. And sometimes people look for everything that's glitzy and, 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 and shiny and everything else, and, and that foundation is being built, and it's being built the right way. And because it's being built the right way, when you start seeing things built upon top of it, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's not going to fall. And that's a lesson for everything in life. Everything in life. So make sure you take time to have that foundation right. Everybody else may be taking off and you're like, man, I'm falling behind. But you're getting that foundation right. And having that foundation right, when you start to take off, when the Lord leads you to take off, when you get increase, now it will stand and it will be stable. Chances are we have all blown it. I felt like I've blown it this week. Uh, there's some things that happen and, uh, you know, we just, we just, we walk through things and, and, and sometimes your reaction to things are not how you think that you should react in a moment, in a moment. And as soon as that happens, you're like, man, oh, I wish you, can I get a do over? <laughs> and sometimes you can't. And sometimes you got to go back and get it right. And so sometimes, you know, you, 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 you may blow it in things. But, you know, the word says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I'm not just talking about sin. I'm just talking about things that, that, that you wish that you can react differently in. It's not sin. It's just, you oh, I wish I would have handled that just a little bit better. Just a little bit better. But our house, our house, our church, our home is a house of love and grace and peace. And this is where you come to get encouraged. Because if I mention that out there, then there's like 12 people that come and say, Pastor Mike, you got, man, you got this. You got this. And that's what people do. That's what we're supposed to do in the body of Christ. We're supposed to encourage one another and love one another. Not heap condemnation on one another. You know, that's not what we do. But this is a house of truth. You tell the truth. Sin is sin. Jesus is the answer. That's why we say, get them to Jesus. He makes all the difference. He makes all the difference. So we don't go soft on that. We don't say, oh, well, it's okay. And then you let people slide by with sin. But you point it out, but you love them enough to get them to Jesus. You don't heap that condemnation on them. There's two places that we always have to go to prepare and repair. We talked about this earlier. It's home in the church. Your home should be a place that you can go to prepare and repair. The atmosphere in that home should be set where you can prepare and repair. The things of the day that happens to you, you go home and you can repair at home because there's love and affection. There's encouragement. There's grace. There's mercy. Everything is there at the home. The church should be the same way. Two places. Set, reset, and center. The world is dangerous. It is. There's a lot of things going on in the world, and the enemy's out there, and there's traps and snares. We say Wednesday night that there's landmines that are set all up on the road of the believer, trying to trip you up, trying to blow you up, trying to, trying to inflict pain and wound upon you, and not only you, but everybody that you're in contact with, because when that landmine blows up and hits you, it hits everybody else around you. So we have to have that place. If you don't, you end up unraveled, your bubbles off center, you're spinning your wheels, you're spinning your wheels, you're not getting traction, and then sooner or later, because you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, you get frustrated, you get angry, you get depressed, and you stop. And that's all the enemy wants. That's all he wants is for you to stop. We said that the enemy has this strategy of disintegration to break up, to break down, to break apart. The cohesion of something. He can't do what he needs to do, which is trying to get truth, trying not to let truth get to all generations. The word says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But if the enemy can stop the truth from going forward, then he's one. And so what he, he can't do it by just taking out one person. He's got to take out families. He's got to take out families. He comes against you. He comes against your spouse. He comes against so he can get the seed, the children, so that he can stop the truth 
from going to all generations. Now, without this, this place of repairing and preparing, what ends up happening is that we only have momentary places to rest. If, you don't, if your home is not, is not a good place to be, and you don't have a church home, where do you go to get repaired and prepared? Where do you go? Man, help those people, Lord. They don't have a place to go. So what happens is we that have salt and light, we go around and we are that momentary rest place for those people that don't have that. You've seen it. You've gone out and you, you, you carry the love of God with you wherever you go. And you run across people that, that look like they're just hopeless. And you have a good word for them. Hey, God loves you. Oh, hey, how you doing today? Uh, you know, how's everything? How? And then all of a sudden, they just let it all out on you. And you just, you sit there and you listen to them. And you give them a moment of hope. Because you tell them about what the Lord is doing in your life. And it's not so much preaching to them. It's just sharing from the overflow of what is in your life. Sometimes you're a momentary rest place by just being Jesus with skin on, not even saying anything about the Lord, but just walking around, smiling, speaking to them, being joyful. We talked about happiness, prayer and praise and affirmation and not being so hard on people. And it all starts with you and, and having play in your life. But even with all of that, you could walk around and give you a perfect example. This lady came to me and I was, I was doing my job at the hospital and she just stopped me and she said, I said, well, how are you doing? She said, I'm doing good, sweetheart. I said, I'm doing good too. And she said, she said, but really I'm not. I said, well, what's, well, what's going on? And she said, you know, she was having this situation with her dad. Now she's older than me. And so her dad is much older than me. And he tried to hurt himself. And she said, he just doesn't know the Lord. And I said, well, we're going to pray for him. And we pray for him. And then she just, she looked at me and she smiled and she said, you glow all the time. She said, I knew that there was something different about you. You walk around here and you smile at everybody and you speak to everybody. She didn't know anything about me. But she knew that she had to share that with somebody, a momentary place of rest. We have to be that for people that don't have a place to prepare and repair. Momentary places of rest. But your heart is that they that home would be that place and that they would get into a set church and that, that church would be that place for them as well. Invite them here. Spend time with them. There has to be a place for everybody and everybody has a place. So home what, what the Lord is trying to do is raise uh, healthy, happy, stable, fruitful, blessed people. That's what he's trying to raise. And in that, that, there's a word right in the middle of that. Healthy, happy, stable, blessed, fruitful, blessed people. Stability. Stability. Home should be a place that is stable. Now, my daughter, if she is watching, I'm so sorry, Monet. Um, she used to be, when she was growing up, before we had Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all this, she had this little social media thing, and her, her, her handle on the social media thing was called uh, Hamster Girl. Hamster girl. She loved hamsters. And she had this hamster at one time, and we were living in Japan, and we, we went out to eat or something, and she had her hamster on the shelf. But the shelf was actually the radiator. And uh, it got cold at night, and before I left out, I turned up the heat in the house. The heat was off, and I turned up the heat in the house. And we got home, and the hamster's just... <laughs> The hamster's kind of laying on its side and just kind of moving real slow. And it's like, what is going on? She was like, Dad, my hamster, my hamster. And I was like, well, what did you do to it? She said, I didn't do anything to it. It's just, you know, I, I, I 
did everything normal. I, I fed it and I gave it water and, and everything. I was like, Monet, it is hot in here. What is going on? And then I looked down and the cage is on the radiator. It's on the heater. And so we took the cage off the heater and we, we put it in another part of the house. And, and about 20 minutes later, the hamster was back to its normal self. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> the takeaway is that the environment changed for that hamster. The environment changed. That dad, dad, dad almost killed the hamster. <laughs> Would have been bad dad. He almost killed the hamster. But the environment changed. It was no longer stable for that hamster to be able to have a good, healthy life. Home should be a place that is stable and balanced. So today we want to share some of those things that helps your home to become stabilized. Because what, without stabilization, you're not going to have long happiness. You're not going to be, you're not going to have fruitfulness and you're not going to have the blessing that the Lord would have for you. Stability is vital. It's vital. It's vital. Children need stability. Adults, you know, if you want to see a happy, productive worker, tell them that they have stability in their job. So stability is important for you as well. And the Lord would want us to have stability in our spiritual lives and stability in our houses, our life, our home, our families. So here's seven things, seven uh, things that will add stability to our home. And we're going to move pretty quickly, but um, there's a lot to take in. These things, if you do it, will inject stability into the atmosphere in your home. First thing, sorry. I'm sorry. We have to say we're sorry. When I was a child, you know, your parents, you do something and your, and your parents make you say you're sorry. Go and tell them that you're sorry. You're like, mm, sorry. Sorry. He's like, you're not really sorry. We have to say we're sorry and have a genuine attitude of remorse behind it. As I got older and we had kids, Pastor Pam and I, and she, I, she did this and it was really good. She said, you're not going to say you're sorry. What you're going to do when you apologize is say, please forgive me for this. Because when you do that, you're taking ownership and knowledge of what you've done to hurt the other person. So then we would take our kids to the sibling and we say, okay, you have to apologize. I'm sorry. No, no, you're going to apologize correctly. Please forgive me for kicking you. I won't do it again. Okay, I forgive you. And then you move on. Are you sorry that you got caught? Are you sorry that you hurt the heart of God? That's the intent. The intent of the heart. Are you sorry that you got caught? Or are you sorry that you hurt the heart of God? We have to say that we're sorry. But some of us say, man, you know, you, you have to admit that you're wrong. But I'm never wrong. I can't remember the last time I was wrong. I'm always right. We have people that never want to apologize for anything. And they know that they're wrong, but they still can't bring themselves to saying, I'm sorry. That's pride. And we talked about pride a couple of, a couple of Wednesdays ago. But what your apology should be rooted in is humility. Some people, some of us, <laughs> some of us like to argue just to argue. You know you're wrong, but you keep on arguing just to see how it's going to turn out. And I was like that. I was one of those people that, man, oh, yeah, I'm, I love a good debate. Let's go. You know that you're wrong is a $3 bill, but you're still debating. You still can't. That becomes detrimental in the home. 
You could do that with your buddies out on the street and you're talking about sports and things like that, politics, and you can, you can take a stand and won't move off of that stand. Even if somebody proves you wrong in that stand, you're going to hold on to it. You can do that, but not in the home. It's not profitable in the home. It's prideful. James 4, 6 in the New King James Version, it says, while she pulls it up, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but give grace to the humble. Grace to the humble. Humility, humility, humility releases grace. Humility releases grace. And we're going to need grace in our home. Got to have grace in our home. And you're going to need God's grace and God's help in our home in order to do the things that God has called to be done in our homes. And you might even be right. You might even be right in your argument. But it's not so much about being right, but being healthy and having a healthy relationship in the home. Sometimes, even when you're right and you're having this time of close, intense fellowship, that you may say, hey, I don't want this, and disengage from it and just say, I'm sorry. I don't want this. I don't need this. We don't need this. Our home doesn't need this. And give the other person a way out. Sometimes we have to do that. But I'm right. Is it better to be right or have peace in your home? Is it better to be right or have peace in your home? Grace and humility go together. Humility releases grace. And by giving that other person a way out, that extends grace to them. And you're humble before the Lord. And then there are things that he will bestow upon your home. Peace to this home. Matthew 5, 9. Matthew 5, 9 in the New King James. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Are you a peacemaker in your home? Do you speak peace to your home? Do you go about making peace to your home, bringing peace to your home? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. What a strong thing to have peace in your home. You take the hit. You Man, I don't want to take a hit. You don't understand. I'm right, and I have to prove that I'm right all times. But are you a peacemaker? I don't want to take the hit. I could be a peacemaker, but I just don't want to take the hit. Why should I take the hit? Jesus did. Jesus did. He came. He came, and he came not to be served, but to serve. He came and he took the hit for things that he didn't do so that we can have life and life everlasting. So if he could take a hit, why can't we? Humility releases grace. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons, daughters, children of God. Amen. Amen. Number two, serve. Serve. Our master served and called us to serve. Galatians says uh, that uh, through love, serve one another. Matthew also says, Jesus said this while talking about the parable of the talents. Uh, he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Are you lacking joy in your life right now? Serve. Serve. Now, I'm not going to get into my rant about serving. I'm not going to get into it, but real serving, real serving is a unique kingdom dynamic that you don't find anywhere else. Real serving, unique kingdom dynamic. You have people serving and serving roles, and sometimes it's for pay, and sometimes it's under duress, but I'm talking about genuine serving, heartfelt serving, loving God, overflow, serving. When you serve, you release, you release, it comes out of you. Or God releases it and it comes out of you. Kingdom life and kingdom joy into wherever 
you serve. That's why when you come in and you see all of these people serving, there's a different atmosphere in here. They're excited. You walk in, you see Jenna, and she's smiling. She's like, hey, welcome. <laughs> That's her every time she's serving. I've never seen her not like that. That's, it releases kingdom life and kingdom joy. It's just joy all over her. That's heartfelt serving, genuine serving. That's the energy that you feel when you come in here. If you don't have joy, you need to be serving. And I'm not just talking about serving here, although we need you to serve here. But we're talking about serving one another in your home. Do you serve one another in your home? Man, I'm not serving that joker. No. No. You don't know what they do. Well, are you going to have kingdom life and kingdom joy released in you? It's about you. This is all about you. At the end of Happy last week, we said you. That why stood for you. And there was things that you needed to do. It all started with you. All of this from beginning to end is about you. Not about anybody else. And always serving one another. And you know, we, we ask you to serve at church, not so much because we need stuff done. You know, the, the church has had 80-20 rule that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And we want to flip that around here at Redemptive Grace. But serving is about you. It's about you. Yes, there are things that need to be done, but I'm not begging anybody to come and serve. Service should be an outpouring of your love and your affection, genuine serving of the Lord. And to be in the body of believers and to sharpen one another and to be around people that will love you. Serving. Serving. If you quit having a servant's heart, you'll go selfish. You'll go inward. You'll get hard. You'll get critical. You'll diminish. You'll implode. You'll void out kingdom life and kingdom joy. This should be in all of us. You'll void it out. I don't know about serving. You should give it to the Lord and let him show you. And don't serve out of duress. Don't serve out of manipulation or coercion. Serve out of a grateful heart. And then you release kingdom life and kingdom joy. Third thing, stay or say, say. Words are powerful. <laughs> Words are powerful. Proverbs 18, 21 in the message. Words kill. Words kill. We could just stop right there. Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. It's pretty plain. Words kill or give life. They're either poison or they're fruit. You decide. You decide which words you're going to use. You decide. Colossians 4, 6 in the New King James Version. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Okay, we're going to go to um, Colossians 6 in the message. We're going to compare them. Be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation. Not put them down. Not cut them up. Let's think about conversations we've had this last week. Was your speech gracious? Did you try to bring the best out of others? They didn't have to be present to win. Did you try to bring out the best in them in your speech and conversation? Did you put them down or cut them up? Ephesians 4.29, New International Version. Do not let any un unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, this is all about us. This is not saying, hey, was I provoked? Did somebody offend me? Did, did, was I mad? Was I angry? Did I have cause? Did I feel justified? It didn't say anything about that. It just says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. This is a choice that you make. This is a choice that I make. This is a choice we all make. 
we all have the Ephesians 429 message. Let's compare what the message says. Watch the way you talk. Watch it. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouths. Say, what only, say only what helps each word a gift. Let nothing foul, dirty come out of your mouth. Some of us, that old-fashioned remedy for having a foul mouth, your parents took that bar of soap, washed it out. Some of us need a spiritual cleansing of our mouths. Let nothing foul or dirty come out. Each word should be a gift. A gift. Is each word that you speak a gift? Is each word that I speak a gift? We'll, th no condemnation, but this is reflection. I get it first. So he deals with me first. Each word a gift. Ephesians 429 Amplified. Let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever, ever, Dr. Jim says it's in those little brackets, <laughs> ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others as it is fitting to the need and to the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace, God's favor, to those who hear it. Do your words give God's favor, give grace to those that hear it? Do your words give favor, God's grace, to the ones that are taking it in? Or do they walk away wishing that they hadn't had a conversation with you? Words are powerful. And your tone matters. Your tone matters. Pastor Pam said, watch your tone. Always with me, watch your tone, watch your tone. Well, it's not what you say, it's how you said it. Oh. Now you're saying I got to watch my words and how I say it. Man, come on. It's too much today. It's way too much. But tone, ma tone matters. Stop being harsh. When we use harsh tones, it's like burning trash on the inside of your home. Harsh tones are like burning trash on the inside of your home. And once you release that, it takes a while for that to clear out of the atmosphere. It takes a while. Fourth thing is seek. Seek means to look for and to try to find. The scripture says, seek and you will find. Think about this. What are you seeking for? Whatever you're seeking for, you're looking for, you're investigating for, you're hunting for, eventually you will find. Seek and you will find. Two things we should always be looking for in our in our houses, our homes, our life, our family, is to seek good. Seek good. Seek good. Good is all around you. Seek it. Seek it. And when you find it, reward it. What you reward continues to grow. What you reward will grow. Another way to put it is what is rewarded will be repeated. When you catch your children doing good, you say, good job. Good job, little Johnny. Good job. You did. And Johnny's ready to repeat that action again so that they can get the affirmation from their parents. What is rewarded is repeated. Seek good. Find opportunities to seek out the good. Well, there's no good in my home. I bet you if you look hard enough, you will find some good in there. You will find some good. Second thing is seek God. Seek God. Seek him in everything. Deuteronomy 4.29, New NIV version. But if from there you seek the Lord, your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart. You will find the Lord if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. You will find him if you seek him. A lot of times we say, we can't find God, but you're not looking for him. The same way that you were looking for a spouse before you married them, you was on the hunt. 
You had to find them. And once you found that person, you was always seeking them. Couldn't let them go. With all your heart and with all your soul. If you seek the Lord like that, you will find him. You will find him. No matter the circumstance, the issue, the problem, seeking God, he either will unlock that situation, circumstance, or issue in your life or show you the keys or the solution to that issue if you seek him. Fifth thing, really quickly, so Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Sowing and reaping. We're just going to leave it there. Sowing and reaping. For he who sows to the flesh will reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit of life will reap everlasting life. You have to sow for the harvest you want. You got to sow for the harvest that you want. Kingdom Women did a whole little uh, mini Friday deal on sowing and reaping, and they planted seeds, and those seeds are starting to germinate. I started to bring Pastor Pam's little pot with her seeds in it, and her flowers are starting to come up out of the ground now. But a lot of times we want something and we're not willing to sow it. What kind of seed are you using? Are you putting down good seed? Is the soil ready? But we stand there and we want a harvest that we never sowed for. And we expect it to come when we never did the work of going out and tilling the ground and pulling up the weeds and making sure that it had enough nourishment, water and everything else and sunlight. But we want that harvest that we see somebody else getting because they put in the time, energy and effort. So, so, Job 4, 8, New King James. Even, if I, even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. If you plow iniquity and you sow trouble, you can't be frustrated when iniquity and trouble comes your way. You can't say, I don't understand this. Where is this coming from? Because you're out there sowing it, and you're plowing it, and you're planting it, and you're nurturing it, and you're perpetuating it. And then when it comes back to you, you're like, man, I don't understand. I'm, I'm, man, where's all this stuff coming from? It's the word of God. It's the word of God. Proverbs eleven eighteen. The wicked man does not, does deceptive work. But he who sows righteousness will have a sure reward. It starts out in saying, hey, if you're wicked, you do deceptive things. But those that sow righteousness will have a sure reward of righteousness. They will have their reward. They will have their reward. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. You don't like the seed that you're getting at home? Check what you're sowing. Check what you're sowing. That's pretty black and white. And again, there's no condemnation. But if you don't like what's going on at home, instead of complaining and being critical about it, check what you're sowing. The common denominator, I've said it before and before and before, is you. It's me. If I don't like what's going on in, in my home, I got to check what I'm sowing. Sixth thing, smile. Smiling is the quickest form of sowing and reaping. Smiling. We're wired that when we see a smile, we return the same smile, unless there's something broken. There's some people I smile at at work, and they never smile back. Some people I say, good morning, and they keep walking, and I stop. Good morning. <laughs> I'm going to make you talk to me. <laughs> but when you smile... It generates something in somebody and it's returned. It's reciprocated. Smiling is the quickest form of sowing and reaping. Smiling is contagious. You can play Charles. It's contagious. Your smile, your face is a billboard to you. 
The scripture says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When I see certain people, they don't have to say anything. They don't have to do anything. They just show up and just the way that they look when they show up. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The smile is a billboard. It is contagious. It is contagious. But unfortunately, some of us have lost our smile. Some of us have lost it. The world is tough. The world is heavy. And we got to get our smile back. People are so tied up in life that when they're walking around, they're just like face all tight all the time. And it's like, man, what's, hey, hey, what's going on? Oh, nothing's going on. Well, why is your face so tight? Really? Smiling releases all of that. It releases all of that. We have to practice smiling at times. The older we get, we get set in our ways and we get, we get, we get focused on things and, and, and you can walk around and you, you, you're portraying something that you're not. You're portraying it. In this article, The Science of Smiling, what happens to our brain when we smile, it states that neuronal signals, neurons, neurons those neuronal signals, travel from the cortex of your brain to the brain stem, the oldest part of our brain. And from there, the cranial muscles carry the signals further towards the smiling muscles of our face. Once the smiling muscles on our face contract, there is a positive feedback loop that now goes back to the brain and reinforces our feelings of joy. And just by smiling, you get that positive feedback loop and you can feel it even into your chest category. The research goes on to say that it is the same effect as if somebody handed you some money or gave you some chocolate. See, you're smiling. You're smiling. People love chocolate and they love money. Those things happen. Those things happen. It affects you. It affects you. The muscles of your eyes and your mouth are connected. And, and it talks about, the scripture says in Proverbs 1530. 1530. The light in your eyes of him whose heart is joyful rejoices the hearts of others and good news nourishes the bones. In the original, in the original language, it talks about the light in your eyes. The light in your eyes. Some of us, the light in our eyes have gone out. It's gone out. And we got to get it back. We've got to get it back. It nourishes the bone. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. We said that in Psalms 144.15. That was our scripture last week. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. It was something that we memorized that when, 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 when you need happiness to come, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. If your God is the Lord, you should be happy. You should be happy. Sorry, say you're sorry, serve, say, seek, sow, smile, and lastly, two minutes, stand. Stand. We have to be able to stand in our home. In Ephesians, in the context of spiritual battle, war, struggle, it says that having done all to stand, stand. Stand. But what does that mean? It means that you have to get yourself prepared, positioned, that you are at the place that you will stand, endure, and wait. I will stand for some things and I will stand against some things. When I stand for some things, I will position myself spiritually. I will stand until it comes. But if I stand against some things, I will position myself and I will prepare myself and I will stand until it goes. We have to have endurance. We have to get ourselves positioned. He will fill us with his grace. He will help us. His spirit, his word, his truth will do a work in us. We have to stand. We have to have endurance. We give up so easily. We, say, we have these New Year's resolutions, and by, by January 7th, 
it's, it's over with. We're like, oh. You know, I heard somebody say a joke. It's funny. It says, I miss going to the gym today. That makes five years now. <laughs> That's terrible. It's terrible. But we have to have some endurance. We have to have endurance. In my home, I'm spiritually getting myself together, ready, in position. I will stand until and wait until the things I want to come. Let's get these things together. We can do it. There's stabilizers in the home. Stabilizers in the home. We said that we, we have to say we're sorry. We have to serve. We have to say those things. We have to seek the Lord. Seek good. Seek God. We have to sow. We have to smile. And we have to stand. And when we do that, our home will be better stabilized. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this word. I thank you, Lord, that as you're improving our homes, our houses, our life, our home, our family, that there are some things we need to know, that wisdom, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, we can't pretend like we know, but we have to know. I thank you, Lord, that you are building a life, a home, a family, that we're going to put you in the house and we're going to add value, Lord. We're going to speak peace. We're going to get anger out. We're going to be balanced in the name of Jesus. We're going to be happy, Lord. And then we're going to have stability in our homes. Help us, Lord, as we go forward, improving every aspect of our life, that your word will touch every aspect of our life. And we just give you all glory, honor, and praise for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 At this time, redemptive grace really quickly. I know it's storming outside. Um, we have our dollar offering. Our offering is a dollar. It is for uh, benevolence. The word says that the poor will always be among us. We are collecting a dollar little as much in the master's hands. If everybody would hold up their dollar. Look around you. If anyone does not have a dollar, give them a dollar. Amen. And we say together, I vow to remember the poor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our prayer workers are coming forward. Remember, therefore, there now is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Maybe your home is not the way that we're talking about it, but it can be. It can start today. It can start today. It can start right now. Father, we thank you for everyone that's within the sound of my voice. We ask, Lord, that you continue to bless your people. Father, bring stability in their house. Let nothing be missing, lacking, or broken. In Jesus' name, let them not leave out of here the same way that they've come in. Let them be stable in every aspect of their life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hug five people and you are dismissed in the Lord, amen.